I think it's quite possible that his body was eaten by dogs and that there was never even a full tomb to say nothing of an empty tomb. If the Messiah hasn't been raised, our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. But my basic claim here is that resurrection does not need to involve something happening to a corpse. The followers of Jesus continue to experience him as a living reality after his death. No resurrection means that sin has not actually been dealt with. Good day, my Christian friends. I'm Dr. Frederick Mulder. Welcome back to Evangelical Platform, a ministry dedicated to preserving the gospel in a complex, messy, postmodern world. Today, I have two controversial things to discuss. Number one, can you have real saving faith and at the same time believe Jesus' dead corpse was devoured by wild animals or dogs? And secondly, can you remain in a church or a denomination where the professors and the ministers openly reject the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ? Now, to answer this, I'm focusing today on Tom Wright. I studied under Tom Wright at Durham University. I've learned a ton from him. I've got so many of his books. But today's going to be a very difficult program for me to make because I really appreciate his scholarship and I've learned so much from him. But on this particular issue, he was incredibly disappointing for me. His friendship with Marcus Borg. They studied together at Oxford and in personal correspondence and also in public, he said that Borg, although they disagree substantially on the resurrection, he is a Christian and he has real faith. And the question therefore is, can you have real faith and believe the tomb of Jesus wasn't empty? Let's read a verse that I discussed with Tom Wright, and that's from Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And this is what it says. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So saving faith must be belief in the resurrection of Jesus. But is this the bodily resurrection? And to get that answer in the same book in Romans, if we go to Romans chapter 8, verse 9 and 10, this is what it says. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And now, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. The Greek is thneta sumata, your body through the spirit who lives in you. So in Romans, it's bodily resurrection that is of necessity for saving faith. And what is more, if we read the last chapter of Romans, where Paul is now finishing the letter and consolidating everything he discussed, he, he, he talks to them about separating from those who cause division, those who deny the bodily resurrection and want to bring in all sorts of heresy in the church. This is what he says in 16 verse 17. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. And now he says this, keep away from them. We should not be in fellowship with him. We should not have holy communion with him. Uh, Tom Wright said that he had holy communion with Marcus Borg. Now, there is a crucial distinction, of course. Unbelievers sharing the gospel on the public platforms, Act 17 at the Areopagus, where the Epicureans and the Stoics were. Paul shared the gospel there. He called them up to repentance. They laughed him out. So there is a place to have a dialogue with skeptics, like Wright and others have done in the past. But the question is, can we be in fellowship with those who claim to know Christ? Can we be in their cathedrals? Can we have Holy Communion with them when they deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus? 
Now, Paul's reference to keep away from these people who cause division also reminds us, of course, of 2 Timothy 2, where Paul says, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. And then he talks about two people who denied the future bodily resurrection. And then later on, he says that everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness and later on he says in the last days you know this people will raise up people who will say just what they want to hear and then he calls on Timothy to be faithful to scripture now the second question is therefore can we remain in denominations where bishops and professors and ordained ministers publicly reject the bodily resurrection of Jesus and this takes us to the Anglican tradition uh, where we get also the Protestant principles that is crucial for a true church. And those three are, number one, the faithful preaching of the word of God, two, the right administration of the sacraments, and three, church discipline over especially those in positions of spiritual authority. So there should be church discipline applied for the preservation of the flock, to preserve them, to protect them from wolves, to enter the fold. Now, um, let me finish this section today by quoting from Gerald Bray, who's probably the number one church historian in the Anglican tradition. And then I'm going to finish with a quote from C.S. Lewis to try and encourage us to remain faithful to Christ. Um, Gerald Bray wrote a little book on heresy, schism and apostasy, where he reflects on the history of doctrinal development in the Church of England. I'm going to just read for us three paragraphs to try and really distill what's going on at the moment in the Church of England. He says on page 61, It can be safely concluded that no appeal to the formularies of the Church of England in a matter of heresy is likely to succeed, and that anyone who tried such a thing would be blackballed and effectively driven out of the Church, either by those of a different persuasion or by those who do not want to rock the boat. And you sense as you read further how Gerald Bray is frustrated with what's going on in his denomination. And here on page 79 he says, There is nothing more embarrassing than having to explain to representatives of other churches why we put up with heresy and unbelief, even at the highest levels of the church. And listen now here, he talks about the bodily resurrection on page 84 and what it takes to be ordained in the Church of England today. Listen to what he says. It would be hard to find anyone who has been denied ordination for failing to believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. But many ordinands can testify to the problems they have had with their bishops when they have refused to wear a stole as if the piece of cloth around their necks was more important than those left behind in the empty tomb! Exclamation mark. And now I want to finish with a quote from C.S. Lewis. In 1959, Lewis gave a very important talk at Westcott House, a very liberal Anglo-Catholic college in Cambridge, and he was very concerned about theological liberals at the time who denied the resurrection and so forth. And he finishes his paper talking about how he used to be an atheist and then he became a Christian and he believes in the resurrection. And that he believes much more than the bishops of his own church. And this is how he finishes. Missionaries to the priests of one's own church is an embarrassing role. Remember, Gerald Bray also spoke about being embarrassed. Here you have C.S. Lewis, more than 50 years earlier, talking about embarrassment as well. Though I have a horrid feeling that if such mission work is not soon undertaken, the future history of the Church of England is likely to be short. C.S. Lewis, who was embarrassed about his own church and having to spread the gospel among bishops in the 1960s. My friends, the tomb is empty. Christ is risen. There is hope for the future. Can I encourage you to join a church where your preachers, where your professors 
believe in the bodily resurrection and empty tomb of Christ and that you will not compromise for whatever reason and stay in a church where that core foundational truth of the Christian faith is compromised. Can I encourage you to stand firm because as 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 says, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain because the tomb is empty. Christ is risen. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you and thank you for watching today. Goodbye.